So basically this paper that we have written um, uses this technique known as MADS. I don't know how familiar you guys are with this multi-dimensional audit data sampling. Um, I, don't think that, I don't think they are familiar. Yeah. Okay. So that's not a big deal. I can go through and explain that uh, in the presentation. Um, but essentially this whole jumbled up title here is explaining to you guys uh, that we did two interesting new things with this paper primarily. So um, the issue that we're going to discuss here is with the general ledger. I'm going to explain to you why that's important in a little bit. Um, but that is a data set um, that has never really been analyzed. Uh, auditors look at it, but not really um, in too much detail. So that was really one contribution that this paper had was like a comprehensive look at how to audit this. Um, the other contribution that was pretty significant was dealing with large population sampling. Uh, now the MADS technique is basically a new way of suspicion scoring sampling. Uh, so I'll explain later exactly how that works, but, um, traditionally auditors use, you know, either random sampling, um, or judgmental sampling. And that's not something that really works very well these days because of the size of the data that auditors are handling, especially with publicly traded firms, especially with large scale audits. Uh, it's just too much. I mean, to expect to audit, for example, 300 records out of several million uh, and make some kind of conclusion based on that is a bit of a stretch in my opinion. Um, so we kind of applied this methodology that Professor No came up with to this data set that's like a new kind of data set uh, and sort of got some really interesting results. Um, and we did this as part of the radar initiative, the Rutgers AICPA data analytics research initiative. Um, and so that was with the big four and then the next biggest four and the AICPA and CPA Canada, right, Professor? Yes. And uh, I think the PCOB was like loosely involved, but I don't know. No, they were not. Really? We, they weren't? We, okay. That's what we are trying to do now. That's what I'm going to talk a little bit later. Uh, okay. Um, so it was a pretty big uh, research project and we had access to these auditors, which we used uh, in kind of helping guide this paper. But um, I'll get into all of that. Uh, it's kind of a long slideshow. I'm going to go through some of it a little quickly because um, I'm assuming it's more important that you learn a little bit more about the theory than on the um, than on the uh, individual data bits. You have all of that in the paper, so you can always reference that. Um so essentially, this is a long overview slide, but it's explaining to you guys what I've already sort of talked about. So we're using this risk-based sampling methodology, MADS. Uh, we call it a sampling methodology, but it's not really. It's a full population testing um, methodology. The reason why it's called a sampling methodology is because while we apply tests to the entire population, the essential goal with MADS is you have a whole huge population of data and you generate um, sort of tests, or we call them filters, right? Because the auditors don't like when we call them tests. So we call them filters, and you apply these filters to the data set. For example, uh, looking for duplicate entries or um, looking for things that violate particular internal controls. And you apply these filters to the entire population. Um, as you apply the filter, each filter has an associated weight with it. Right. So um, if it's a very important thing that you're looking for, it's a higher weight. If it's something that's not as important, it receives a lower rate. And every time a record violates a filter, it gets that weight associated with it. OK, so you add all these weights together. And at the end, you have a total score for each record based on which filters it violated. OK, you then rank all of the records by their score and. For a test of details, you sample, right, the same number that you would sample in a judgmental or in a statistical sample, but you're sampling the riskiest records. And when I say sample, that means you pull them and you do the test of details on them. Okay, so there is the full population testing, so to speak, where we apply the filters to the entire population. And then based on that, you do your final sampling. So that's why they refer to it as a risk-based sampling methodology. Okay, the advantage with this approach 
is that there are going to be some records that don't violate any filters. And we know with exact certainty how many of those records are in the population, right? We're not using any kind of extrapolation from judgmental or statistical sampling approaches. We know with hard, hard proof how many are clean records, so to speak, with respect to the test that we've run. All right, so that's sort of why we wanna use something like MADS. Um, we have these issues with external audits where they have these time constraints and things like that. So we do understand that you have to sample, um, but essentially we need to focus their efforts on the riskiest things rather than just you know sampling some records that we know are going to be clean. Um, so this methodology basically bridges this gap that I'm going to talk to you guys in a little bit, this gap between statistical and non-statistical sampling. And um, the other contribution, as I mentioned, isn't only using MADS on this new data set, but um, basically uh, you know, proving that this works, right? And proving that there are issues. And the way that we do that is that we rank the importance of the issues that we've detected based on uh, consultations with auditors, right? So we spoke to, we had access to five senior audit partners from these large firms, and we worked with them to develop which tests to use, right? Because we came up with tests ourselves, but we wanted them to provide feedback on the filters and suggest additional ones that maybe we didn't think of. Um, also to value the importance of what different risk factors they wanted to look for in the data set. And finally, we use that to attribute the different weights to the different filters, all right? That's sort of our substitute for auditor judgment, right? Because we're trying to do this as academically as possible. Um, and so the biggest thing that we were kind of looking for, which you can see on the last point here, was um, low risk, uh, sorry, low frequency, high risk issues. Uh, so things that don't occur very often, but are very high concern that may not be detected in a regular statistical sample, right, because of the low frequency at which they occur. Uh, and then some systemic problems that maybe auditors would overlook in like a judgmental audit sample. Um, and then we found quite a few internal control system weaknesses. So we wanted to make sure that our uh, methodology worked not only for the financial data, which is obviously the main point of an audit, but we have to audit internal control and make sure that internal controls are free of any kind of material defects. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to just interrupt me because um, that, I think it's just the easier way, easiest way to work this. Um, so I, I won't be offended or anything like that. Um, so to back up a little bit, why do we care about the general ledger to begin with? Um, so the life of a business event from its beginning to its representation to investors uh, is represented in this diagram here. So we have the business event occurring. It gets journalized as a journal entry. Okay. And then those journal entries impact account balances. The general ledger is basically an accumulation of all of these account balances, right? Just the totals, all right? You use the information from the general ledger to finally compile your financial statements. Now, as this journey occurs, you move from the most granular level of data to the most uh, macroscopic level of data, which is what you have here on financial statements, okay? Now, as a result of moving through this paradigm, you are going to suffer from some information loss, right? So the balance against that is, you know, even though you have business events and journal entries, those are earlier stages, you have more information about the actual transaction, but that means there's more data points for you to have to audit, right? So that's sort of the balancing act, right? At what point do we want, do we have enough information about the transaction, right? So we're moving down this way almost, um, and we have to counterbalance that, right? We want more information about the transaction, but we don't want to have to audit too many documents. And so the solution is to look at this link right here, okay? So this link right here, right? I have that in a couple of slides. So you have this barrier sort of, that's the um, granular information on the top with huge information data points. And then on the bottom, it's combined, but there's, there's fewer data points, but um, there's a lot of information that may be left out. All right. So we focus on this link. And what this link is, is whenever you update an account, 
the account balance on the general ledger is going to get updated. And so our data set, our primary data set is focusing on every time there is an update to a general ledger account, right? When one of those balances changes, we have a record of that and that is what we're going to focus on. So it gives us the ability to link this to journal entries to find out more granular information for tests of details, but it also allows us to get a more macroscopic picture and limit to a degree, believe it or not, um, the data points that we're looking at, okay? And so that's what we're primarily gonna focus on. Um, so the other half of this was the use of this particular sampling technique and full population examination. And there are some issues that are surrounding sampling that are designed to sort of build up this problem that we're trying to solve, all right? So the two issues that we're going to, the two traditional types of sampling we're going to look at are statistical sampling and judgmental sampling, like audit or judgment-based sampling. Um, and there are problems with both of these methodologies. So with respect to statistical sampling, the biggest issue that we have, right? So with statistical sampling, uh, you have a full population, you come up with some mathematical method of determining how many records to pull, and then you randomly pull those records, or you do some type of methodology of sampling all those records um, that doesn't involve too much judgment. Okay, but the issue is, um, how big should your sample really be? And, and this is something that's been a question for a long time. You can see all the way back to Nieder and Lebecki looking at this in the 1970s, all right? And so when you look here, a population of 10 million records, which is small by some regards for large auditors these days. So 10 million records, even if you're looking at a 1% sample, that's 100,000 records that you're going to have to sample, right? That's a huge population for you to test in detail, okay? Now, when we spoke to auditors, we wanted to find out what type of sample they would draw on the population that we were looking at. And, and the records were um, in the millions to tens of millions. And essentially, they recommended 300. Some were a little lower, like 275, 250, some were a little higher, but it was all essentially in that 300 range, okay? So 300 out of a population of 10 million records represents 0.003%, all right, which is tiny. How can you detect a problem, you know, even if you have a thousand records that are, you know, very bad, the likelihood of you detecting that is just so, so slim. Right. So that's the number one problem. And, and researchers have sort of looked at this, uh, even if you go as high as 2%, which is a pretty large sample, right? 2% um, of 10, mil 10 million, that would be uh, 200,000. That's a large number of records. Um, it's really poor at detecting these low frequency, high risk issues. Right. And they found that, you know, once you start to increase the sample size beyond this, uh, you're just creating more work than the benefit that you're going to get. So you, there's still a problem to be had here. Okay. On the other side, the alternative approach to this would be um, other, other types of sampling, which would be judgmental sampling. Um, so these are used according to this 2000 paper, about 85% of the time with auditors. The problem is uh, there's a lot of guidance around this because auditors um are making a judgment based on what records to sample. Okay, so they're not just randomly picking 300, they're selecting 300 specific records, but there's a lot of judgment that goes into that. Um, and that can, you know, cause issues because if they're not looking for a problem that exists, they're never gonna find it, right? They have to specifically be looking for the problem to know to draw those particular samples, right? Um, and so you have not only bias with the sample, but there are studies that show that this also is going to bias your interpretation of the results, right? So that even if you do find some issues, you may dismiss them because of your own bias going into the data set, right? So that's an issue. The other issue is because this is not a statistical sample, you cannot really extrapolate the results of 300 records to the entire population. All right, so we want to try to resolve all of these issues, and the MADS methodology allows you to do that, right? By using the full population examination approach, we can extrapolate our assumptions to the entire population because they're no longer assumptions. We know with certainty exactly 
what problems exist at what rate, as long as we're looking for the problems, right? And the goal is to throw as many problems out there as possible, okay? On the other side, uh, we are limiting the sample size because we are gonna only look at 300, they will just be the 300 riskiest records. So it's very, it's more likely that we're going to discover these high risk issues, even if they're low frequency, because they're gonna receive a high enough score. Okay, and I'm gonna explain how that method works in a bit. So this is the slide just explaining suspicion scoring and full population testing. MADS isn't the only approach. The idea with these approaches is that basically you develop some type of system of scoring all the records, and then you are going to select those records that you believe to be the highest risk. So it's sort of a hybrid approach, all right? Now the MADS methodology operates as follows on here, uh, basically of the whole population. Um, you're going to filter it down based on whatever risk factors you find. That leaves you with a population of notable items. Um, it allows you to basically, so notable items are any items that have failed some, at least one filter, right? So you already know at this point, which items are clean, so to speak. Um, you can then apply some additional techniques. You could do clustering. There's all different techniques that are used in different papers. Uh, we just apply an additional materiality filter for those that we think are more important. Um, and you end up with your final list of exceptional items, which you prioritize based on the weights and you select the final sample based on that. Okay. Um, this is sort of a visual for how it would look uh, broadly. So you have the full population, you have all these different filters. For each filter, when you apply it, you reduce the population. Some filters require a step two because the subpopulation has certain interesting features or you wanna divide the subpopulation further. Um, and then based on that, you apply weights and eventually you sum those weights all up for scoring. How we actually applied it uh, is detailed in this diagram here. All right, it's a kind of a detailed diagram and it looks a little complicated, but basically we start by looking at the data, defining the risk factors, using those risk factors to determine what filters we're going to build or design to target these particular risk factors. And these risk factors are all li linked to audit objectives, okay? Um, we also determine the importance and the weights associated with these individual risk factors and filters that we've designed. Um, we then apply it to the data set, each one, um, work out the little kinks with the filters, uh, compute suspicion scores. Then we develop a threshold for the top 300 or thereabouts. And basically you'll see at the end how we did that. Um, we select all of those records that are bigger than that, right? Sometimes we have to do sub filtering. Um, so that may occur, but in addition, we did this materiality filter. Okay. Uh, and then we basically reviewed the results at the end of this. And to evaluate the results, we use the information that the auditors gave us about the importance of different problems that we'd be detecting. If there are issues with any of this, we repeat the process basically. So it's an iterative process until we get it rolling. So in the real world, when you were to apply this, um, the first application on an audit would be challenging. It would be kind of time consuming, but once you get into it and you've designed the filters, um, and you know what you're looking for, it becomes a much quicker process than what um, auditors may even be using at the moment. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Um, uh, so, Jamie, could, yeah. could you do this in a continuous auditing mode? Absolutely. So that is basically the final step. So in the continuous audit mode, once you've built it using this process here, what you would basically do is you would um, design it so that anytime a new record entered the system, right, or in this case, a new update occurred in the general ledger, you would run it through every single one of the filters that you have and you would assign it a suspicion score. And if the suspicion score violated whatever particular risk threshold number you came up with, then you would flag it for additional review by the internal auditors or for the external auditors. So that's how you would have it in the continuous sense. I think we should write an article about that. Yeah, absolutely. That would be the last chapter of my dissertation. I wanna make that into an article, that'd be nice. Um, so any other questions? 
All right, so briefly our data set, I'm not gonna go into all of this different stuff here, but we used three data sets. So the first data set we used was a majority of what we focused on, and that was uh, general ledger updates. Now the general ledger updates were for a large multinational manufacturer. It occurred over the year 2014, and it was only for one operating segment of the company, but that being said, it operated as like an independent business almost. So there was a full gamut, like all the different types of things that you would expect to see if it was an independent business. Um, and then there was something like three, almost three and a half million uh, data points that we were looking at. So you can see, you know, even if we were to take a sample of 300, um, that would represent a very, very small portion of that total, like what, 0.01%, right? Just so small. Um, we use two additional data sources. Uh, this was designed to sort of mimic, um, what auditors would have access to. So when an auditor goes into the company, they're not just going to be looking at the GL updates. They'd be looking at all these different data sources that they'd have access to. So one of them was the chart of accounts, which tells us what types of accounts we're looking at. So when you look at the data, it's just sort of a number and we don't know what that number corresponds to under the account field. So the chart of accounts lets us map that to a specific type of account, okay? Uh, unfortunately, that was in 2018. So that data, there was like a data disconnect there, but there was not too many changes between 2014 and 2018 um, that really impacted the study, all right? The other data set that we looked at was a list of authorized employees. Now, this was from the year 2019, and there were some problems with that, which we addressed in the paper. The reason why we looked at this is we had quite a few employee-based filters that we wanted to work with. And the auditors, when we were consulting with them, thought this would be a great idea. Uh, the problem is they weren't able to supply us with the older employee list. So we were only able to design, uh, I think we ran one or maybe two filters involving employees, but they were still useful for proving that you could use HR information in conjunction with this. Um, so we did do that. Um, Basically, this is a list of all the different variables. So you can see that there's quite a lot of information that we had to work with here. Um, now, what we have here in the different columns, so we have the name of the variable, um, we have a description, uh, we have the data types, right? And then we have what's called a glare class. So um, another paper that I've been working on is this uh, glare um, general ledger audit risk evaluation is what it stands for. And essentially the idea is this is a framework, right? Um, I should have probably put a picture of that in here, um, but this is a framework that basically associates different risk categories and then suggests different tests that you could run with the categories. And this can be used in conjunction with things like mats, right? So um, in this framework, we basically, um, define different data classes into these different categories. And these different categories are gonna inform you what different types of tests you could run, right? This is explained uh, in the paper. And so uh, these are the different classes that each of these data variables are associated with, which will enable us to select different tests, right? This is our test selection process, okay? So we have that information here as well. Uh, we did omit a bunch of variables, mostly because either there was no information that was added from them, like uh, it was a one-to-one -one match, or there were zero values in that particular um, field, right? So that's mostly why they were omitted. Um, this is the process that we used to sort of Jamie, determine... what, what is a one-to-one -one match? Is it oh, like... it means that there was another variable that it was identical to. Oh, okay. It measured the same thing as another variable. So you just eliminated the duplicate variable. Yeah, yeah. So it's not formally a duplicate. It's got a different name, but it was a one-to-one -one match with that. It'd be, for example, if I had the amount in dollars and the amount in euros, right? It's an exact match at a conversion rate. Um, so we eliminate one of them, right? I mean, that's not exactly what happened. You have document type description. Um, I don't recall. I think that was a match with um, the description up here. Okay. So it was sort of just a duplicate variable. Um, 
So this was the process we used to determine the different filters. Uh, essentially, we had all this available data that we started by examining. Um, we determined some potential problems that might exist, and we used that glare framework that I mentioned to as like a jumping off point for determining what problems might be there. And you'll see in a little bit when I describe the filters, how that fits in with the framework. Now the framework directly uh, links these problems to different audit objectives as well. So you'll see how the different filters directly target individual audit objectives. Okay. So um, we shared this with these um, audit partners and consulted with them to get some kind of feedback to evaluate how important each of these risk factors. So you start with the risks before we, we look at any individual filters. We start with the risks. Um, how important are those risks? What are some filters we can design to target those risks? And what are the audit objectives that we're really trying to work with here, right? So that's sort of how that worked. So we created the filters based on those risks and identified audit objectives. And then we prioritize them using this auditor judgment, this evaluation of what's important and what's not, right? That's kind of giving you the weighting system, all right? Uh, they did provide some additional suggestions. We'll get to that. Now, based on their assessment of importance, right, we had, what is it? I think 10 different um, what could go wrong. So these are the potential risks that you're facing. Things like aggressive earnings man management, backdating particular entries, right? That would be something that's bad, uh, all the way down to um, entering outside of business hours. And the way we calculated this average score was we simply asked the auditors, right? How would you rank this? High, medium, or low, okay? So if they ranked it high, we assigned it a score of three. And if they ranked it low, we assigned it a score of one. So the maximum score is three and the minimum score is one. OK, and then we basically averaged the feedback that we got from the five auditors. OK, so in the case of it being a 2.8, we had mostly threes. Maybe we had one, two. Right. Uh, not all of them reported back on every single thing. Right. That was part of the process. Uh, so that's why some of these numbers, if you divide them up by five, there's no real like or multiply them by five. It, it doesn't really work out. Um, but essentially you can see this is the rank score. So their, their, their most important problems, the ones that they cared about the most are at the top and the ones that they thought were least important are at the bottom. And I just want to note that there was also no consensus. So there was nothing here where people just ranked three of the, everyone said they were all threes and some twos. Sometimes you would get um, two auditors say that they were very important Two auditors say they were not very important and one give it a middle kind of importance, right? And that sort of highlights this issue with auditor judgmental sampling, right? Because some auditors are going to look at it as very important. Some are going to look at it as not important and it's going to impact the way that they draw the sample and then review the sample. So we sort of average that out. Okay. Oh, so we Leo, use this. Hmm? So, um, so can you explain what is the abnormal patterns? Can you give us some examples? of what of abnormal patterns of employee behavior oh you mean for that okay so oh you're talking about this particular thing um so one thing that would be is if an employee uh is typically entering um journal entries that are updating one particular type of account right so if you had an employee in payroll for instance and you're updating the wages payable account and then all of a sudden that employee is updating, um, I don't know, like a work in process account or some other type of account that's outside their scope of normal activity, right? That would be um, what we're looking for here. Now, we were really trying to look for this kind of stuff when we originally started with the data set. Um, but this was an example of something that we were not able to get the data for. So instead of looking for abnormal patterns, which is really what we wanted to do, we were forced into looking at, um, employees that got fired or, you know, left the company for whatever reason, because of that disconnect in employee data, right? Because the other issue could be, you know, an employee might typically use one account, but then their job role changes, things like that. So that's sort of what we we're talking about, abnormal patterns of employee behavior. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. Thank you. No problem. Okay, Jamie, I have another, another question, question here. Yeah, yeah go okay. ahead. So why 
why there were only five auditors yet? Is that because you have some kind of specific requirement for the auditors? Oh, no, no. We had access to eight different firms' auditors, but only five of them were gave us any kind of feedback. It's just the function of who, who, who reported back. Jamie, I have a question too. Uh, mm -hmm. You think if we had given them a list of things that could go wrong, they would be more coherent, I mean, they would answer the same things, or because this one was like a blank list that they had to generate, correct? No, 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 we gave them a list. Oh, um, I don't have it in this slideshow, but we have it in the paper. There's that whole like instrument that we used where we had each of these listed out, and then each of these were li linked with an audit objective. And then uh, like on the paper, we said what could go wrong, what we were thinking with the audit objectives that that particular problem was targeting. We suggested a particular filter for each of these different things, just as a suggestion. And then we asked them for their feedback based on that. And some of them decided not to evaluate particular risks for whatever reason. It's in the paper. I guess I should put it in the appendix for this presentation. It's in the other presentation I have. I just forgot to copy it over because I forgot about the appendix portion. Yeah, meaning this is, uh, uh, meaning, uh, you know, we have been thinking about issues with this, but um, this is actually interesting potential follow-up research project or maybe Miyun, someone that is more interested, that interested in judgment. Um, is it possible that the entire practice has really diverged? Of risk? I think 100%. I think with respect to things that there's guidance on, they're all perfectly in line. Like if you look at the sample sizes, they were all basically 300, which I was pretty surprised about. There was no real variance in that. But in terms of what they believe to be risks, it seemed that um, now this isn't disclosed in the paper because we anonymize who's who's. But when you looked at the raw data, it seemed that there were definitely like different firms and you'd have to ask multiple auditors at the same firm because I don't know if it's just different auditors or different firms. But it seemed to me that potentially what you were looking at was different values uh, like of interest in different firms based on potentially corporate culture, like how we look at tone at the top. And then when the PCOB goes in to assess auditor quality, they look at tone at the top. That could be establishing their assessment of what is risky versus what is not risky. That would be my guess. But again, we only got one audit partner from each firm. So it may be wrong. It may just be that particular audit partner's assessment. 